Hello, this is Dr. Gomez from the University of Texas Health of San Antonio. Today we're going to do core review one. This is for the radiology, American Board of Radiology Board exam, and our multiple cases with key information to remember for test purposes. In each presentation, there will be 20 cases, and this will be the first one in the series of core review. On the first case, we see bilateral PA views of the hands. And the most striking finding is that we have ulnar deviation and subluxation bilaterally at the metacarpophalangeal joints. However, we see no erosions anywhere in the films, not at the metacarpophalangeal joints and not at the interphalangeal joints. There is crowding of the intercarpal articulations bilaterally with subchondrosclerosis and degeneration. So this is what we call a deforming but non-erosive arthropathy. So deforming non-erosive arthropathy is also known as Jakut's arthropathy. Jakut's arthropathy was originally described with rheumatic fever and its uh, joint involvement. However, nowadays it's most commonly seen with lupus. Uh, patients with lupus only 5 to 40% percent present with deforming non-erosive arthropathy. In patients with lupus, the most common musculoskeletal presentation is polyarticular. Uh, arthropathy similar to rheumatoid arthritis. This uh, deforming or ulnar subluxation is due to ligamentous laxity and usually when patients uh, press their hands against the table it will reduce by itself. The important thing is that there are no erosions as compared to other arthropathies where you see bone destruction and jacuts there is deforming of the joints with subluxation and sometimes dislocation, but there are no erosions. This is a patient with polyarthralgia and also bilateral PA views of the hand. And in terms of the hand, sometimes the radiographs can be a little bit heavy, especially when you're trying to take a test, because in terms of arthritis, usually the films have a lot of findings in multiple joints and it's hard to concentrate on one. So, and in this type of case, you just have to take one finding at a time. But the major finding that we see here is that there is a kind of soft tissue masses around the joint in multiple places, metacarpophalangeal joints bilaterally and interphalangeal joints around the intercarpal, radiocarpal and distal radioulnar joints. There is some calcification near around the ulna. Uh, so this is a lumpy bumpy appearance. These are all a bunch of tophi, uh, tophaceous gout. There is also, we don't see it very well here, but there are some paraarticular erosions here with well-defined sclerotic borders. And like arthritis usually coexists, this patient also has osteoarthritis with joint space loss and subchondral sclerosis. So this is a different patient, but similar findings and what we see here, just you want you to pay attention here. So this is a pressure erosion outside the articulation, paraarticular erosion. Note that it has very well-defined sclerotic borders and has an overhanging edge. This is created by a tophus that is outside uh, the joint and within the soft tissues of the index finger. And it's causing that pressure erosion, which is chronic because of those well-defined sclerotic borders. Also, on the distal and the phalangeal joint, there is an erosion as well, and it's paraarticular. Of course, this patient also has osteoarthritis and vascular calcifications. So this is a patient with tophaceous gout. I think in terms of the test, most of the time you're gonna be asked about what tophaceous gout looks like, but if we're gonna try to describe a gout as a disease, uh, the acute phase is usually known as gouty arthritis, and this is usually a monoarticular synovitis. The patient gets this pain in a joint. Usually you don't see anything on radiographs. Uh, most of the time it's self-limiting. And of course you see that synovitis uh, related to crystal deposition due to increased uric acid on the blood. And that crystal deposition causes synovitis and you can see that on MRI. On the chronic phase, which usually takes five to 10 years after the acute phase, uh, we get tophaceous gout. We get deposition of stophi, 
all around the body and it has a predilection to be periarticular. This big tophi just get in the soft tissues and when they touch the bone, the bone feels like it's a foreign object and it tries to engulf it. And that's why you have the overhanging edge because the bone is just trying to eat this piece of uh, tophi, which is uh, crystals and that are a foreign body. And because it's a pressure erosion, it's chronic, and that's why you have the well-defined sclerotic border. But in general terms, uh, tophaceous gout is usually polyarticular. Uh, classically, you have preserved joint space and normal bone mineralization, which is not true in this guy. This guy has advanced disease with, with podagra. Um, this is most the, the tophaceous gout is most commonly seen on the uh, first metatarsal phalangeal joint. So remember. Gouty arthritis is acute gout, usually moniarticular, causes the synovitis. Uh, not much is seen. The facial scalp has the classic findings, which will be a pressure erosion due to the tophi with an overhanging edge, well defined sclerotic borders. And this and the facial scalp, you will have usually preserved joint space and preserved bone mineralization. So we talk about the paraarticular erosions of gout. So I just want to review real quick uh, the erosions by location. This is in general terms. You have to keep in mind that most arthritis coexist, uh, but for test purposes, it's good to know where are the characteristic location of the erosion. So we saw here paraarticular erosion. This green ball is a tophus and it's outside the joint this is the capsule this is the metacarpal head let's say and the proximal phalanx and the yellow line is the cartilage so in gout we have this tophus that creates a para articular erosion it's a pressure erosion with the overhanging edge so outside the articulation para articular is usually of gout in rheumatoid arthritis we see those erosions most commonly marginal and that's so because the capsule extends a little bit beyond the end of the cartilage so if you have a synovitis all the joint uh, the cartilage will protect the central and paracentral bone but it won't protect this area here which is called the bare area and that's why in RA you have marginal erosions most commonly seen when it's acute. In chronic phase, you see more bone destruction, but acutely you see marginal erosion. So, paraarticular gout, marginal RA through the bare area, which is not protected by cartilage and is still within the articulation. S Central erosions in the middle of the joint are usually seen with erosive OA, and that's usually seen at the distal interphalangeal joint and that central erosion gives the appearance of a seagull appearance. So when you see verosive OA, osteoarthritis, you see the seagull appearance because the body of the seagull is that central erosion. In psoriasis, we may see paracentral erosion. So this erosion is here that we see and this gives you the appearance of the Mickey Mouse ears uh, that we see on psoriasis. So this is a general term, but it's good to remember for life and for test purposes. So central, usually erosive OA, gives that seagull appearance at the distal interphalangeal joints. Paracentral erosions will give you that Mickey Mouse ears, and you see commonly in psoriasis. And also remember that paracentral we see with gout and marginal with rheumatoid arthritis. So in this case, we have a patient with chronic elbow pain and we have bilateral elbows on AP and lateral and on the left side is also kind of uh, oblique. So we see here bilateral chronic destructive arthropathies. We see chronic erosions on the distal humerus with well-defined sclerotic borders. We see chronic resorption of both the proximal ulna and radius bilaterally. There is joint subluxation, and also we see some type of joint distension of the joint capsule with hyperdense material. We see it bilaterally. There is a lot of information we can get out of this radiograph. First of all, it's bilateral, so we should think this is a systemic disease. 
Second, we know it's chronic because the erosions are well defined and have sclerotic borders, and there is not too much soft tissue swelling. There is some capsule distension with some hyperdensity, but there is no really uh, prominent soft tissue swelling. So we know it's a chronic arthropathy, and we know it's a systemic process. So on the MRI, we still see the subluxation and large erosions, both on the T1 and T2 with fat suppression. But the most striking finding is that we see within the joint capsule regions of low T1 and low T2 signal intensity. This is related to hemosiderin deposition. This is a patient with hemophilia and chronic and repetitive hemarthrosis. With time, this hemarthrosis resolves and deposits this hemosiderin within the joint. If this was acute, we will see different um, signal intensity within the joint. We may find increased T T1 signal intensity with methemoglobin, but this is a chronic patient with no acute phase, so most of what we see is the hemosiderin deposition. So hemophilia caused that hemosiderin deposition, which is very characteristic. Another a condition of the joint that can give you hemosiderin deposition is PVNS because you have hyperplasia of the synovium, it bleeds on itself, and it leaves the hemosiderin. But PVNS is monoarticular, you see it only one articulation, and this hemophilia is usually in multiple articulations because it is uh, a systemic process. Things to remember for the test is that we usually see this radio dense soft tissue swelling around the joint, and that's the hemorrhage and joint capsule distension. Uh, you see osteoporosis around the articulation when there is uh, active hemarthrosis. Keep in mind that wherever there is blood, there is increased osteoclastic activity. The osteoclasts, which eat the bone and cause loosened lesion or osteoporosis, are activated by increased vascularity. And that's why when you're a young patient in hemophilia, you, will, you may see uh, what is called the overgrown or balloon epiphysis because the epiphysis grow too much because of the blood next to the epiphysis causes to grow uh, unopposed. That increased blood will cause the osteoclastic and osteoblastic activity to work faster than in other places and you will get an overgrown epiphysis. Um, you get large subchondral cysts which is related to intraosseous hemorrhage. Uh, the joint space loss is uniform and late and and the distribution is asymmetrical and sporadic, uh, very common in the larger joints of the body. And in many places, the differential diagnosis will be ju juvenile rheumatoid arthritis. Uh, but in uh, hemophilia, you don't see peristitis and there is no ankylosis. So here we have a case of a patient that came to the ER with shoulder pain. Uh, Radiographs of the shoulder were obtained. This is supposed to be in internal and external rotation. And the first thing we see in this radiograph is that on both internal and external rotation, the proximal humerus appears to be fixed in internal rotation. The other thing that we see is that we see some kind of overlap between the humeral head and glenoid. And we also see a very dense chlorotic line uh, right at the humeral head. Whenever we see a proximal humerus that is fixed in internal rotation, we should always think about posterior dislocation and ask for an axillary view. This is a case of posterior dislocation. Uh, posterior dislocation only happens around 4 to 5 percent of all glenohumeral dislocations. Most of the glenohumeral dislocation, 95 percent of them, is anteriorly. The reason for that is because the scapulas are slanted 45 degrees anteriorly and this is for uh, evolutionary purposes. That was the way that our body evolved to be able to develop hand-eye coordination. We need to have our hands in front of us so we can see them as they move and not behind us. And that's why the shoulder is so unstable anteriorly, but more stable posteriorly. Also, there's a third type of dislocation, which is from uh, superior to inferior. It's called luxatio erecta, but that doesn't happen too often. You don't see them often on radiographs because the patient comes to the ER with the hand, with the arm over their head and they can't move it. So the ER doctor usually knows what's going on. So there are several signs that we see for uh, 
posterior dislocation. Uh, the most important and reliable is the fixed internal rotation, which is also known as the light bulb uh, sign, which means that because the proximal humerus is fixed in internal rotation, we're going to see a light bulb appearance of the proximal humerus both on internal rotation and on external rotation. So that would be the light bulb appearance. Also, there is the throw or through a line, which is this carotid line at the humeral head, and that is related to an impaction fracture. Uh, so those are some of the signs that we see in posterior dislocation. But whenever you have a doubt and there is fixed internal rotation, you should always ask for an axillary view. On this axillary view, we see the glenoid here. All right. The glenoid and we see the proximal humerus. Uh, it's always in an axillary view it's always good to find the coracoid process because whenever you find the coracoid process you know you're anteriorly. So the posterior glenoid is fractured due to impaction. This is a dislocated uh, posteriorly dislocated glenohumeral joint and it's locked because it's impacted in the posterior glenoid and it can reduce. So this is confirmation of the posterior dislocation. Uh, this is what is called a reverse Bancard lesion just because the normal Bancard is in the anterior inferior glenoid. So the posterior is uh, considered a reverse Bancard associated to posterior glenohumeral dislocation. And the reverse heel sacs deformity because it's in the anterior aspect of the humeral head instead of the posterior aspect. So those are um, all the findings that you would see in posterior dislocation. Uh, posterior dislocation is usually related to a direct blow, so uh, most of the time it's going to be somebody with seizures that is fixed in internal rotation and hits the floor or any object with a lot of force, and that direct hit to the proximal humerus sends it posteriorly, and that's why you get a posterior dislocation. Okay, so we have an ankle MRI, T2 fat suppressed images, sagittal and axial. And we're going to review a little bit of anatomy. This patient had chronic ankle pain. So let's review a little bit of anatomy. Uh, this is the Achilles tendon, as you guys know. And due to the Achilles tendon, there is a triangle of fat known as the Kegger fat pad, and it can get inflamed in any problems of the Achilles tendon. Uh, this bone here is called the ostragonum, right? Uh, in the sagittal view, the flexor hallucis longus muscle extends very distal, and you can see it, and it's the anterior uh, border of the Kager's fat pad. On the axial images, we see right posterior to the uh, talus, the flexor hallucis longus tendon, and its tendon sheath, which, which in this case is uh, distended. Uh, so, in this case, what we see is uh, inflammation at the posterior ankle adjacent to the ostrigonum, all this region, with associated tenosynovitis of the flexor hallucis longus. That combination of findings is suggestive of posterior impingement, also called ostrigonum syndrome. It is very common on ballet dancers or soccer players that they do extreme forceful plantar flexion. So, the foot will go this way, and as it goes this way, the calcaneus will go up and cause impingement of the posterior ankle. This inflammation causes friction at the tendon sheet of the, of the flexor hallucis longus, and you see that tenosynovitis. So ostragonum syndrome, it, uh, associated to the ostragonum, usually when it's very large, as the process of the talus, which is a long bone process, uh, posterior to the talus, or if you have a non-united uh, fracture of the posterior talus. So always remember, you see inflammation around the ostragonum with associated tenosynovitis of the flexor hallucis longus, you should suggest ostragonum syndrome related to posterior impingement of the ankle. Here is a patient with chronic wrist pain. Initial PA and lateral radiographs of the wrist show 
advance the generation of all the articulations about the wrist joint, including the radiocarpal, distal radial ulnar joint, and the intercarpal articulations. There is rotatory subluxation of the scaphoid, and this is related to chronic tear of the scaphoid ligament. When the scaphoid ligament is torn, the lunate usually uh, angulates dorsally and the scaphoid starts rotating upon itself. This is called rotatory subluxation. This abnormality in alignment causes uh, degeneration and scaphoid advanced collapse, which is uh, what we see in this case, is greater depending on how much degeneration there is, is how many joints are involved. The more joints that are involved in degeneration, the ad the more advanced the uh, grading. So when you see a lot of degeneration in the wrist and you see rotatory subluxation of the scaphoid or widen scaphoid interval, think about scaphoid advanced collapse. So remember sequela from ligamentous tear of the scaphoid ligament. Uh, you get advanced degeneration and for the test it is associated to CPPD. The treatment is arthrodesis, most common what is called a four-corner arthrodesis. We have a patient that presented uh, to clinic with chronic knee pain and radiographs were obtained. So here are lateral radiographs of the knee joint and we see that this gentleman has degeneration, osteoarthritis with osteophytes, subchondral sclerosis. There is suggestion of a large effusion but the most striking finding are these multiple ossified bodies, uh, the suprapatellar space, as well as within the joint and likely within a Baker cyst posterior to the knee joint. There are some osseous bodies projecting here within the Hoffa's fat pad, which is the infrapatellar fat pad. This is a case of synovial osteochondromatosis. So synovial osteochondromatosis comes into flavors, primary and secondary. Primary is idiopathic, and this is related to a metaplasia of the synovium, so it proliferates. And when it proliferates, it becomes synodules, then they detach and they go around the articulation, and eventually they calcify. When they're not calcified, we call it synovial chondromatosis and not osteochondromatosis. We wait for them to be ossified. Um, so, those are the stages, proliferation of the nodules, of the synovium, formation of nodules, and then detachment, and ultimately calcification. So the secondary synovial osteochondromatosis is related to osteoarthritis, and you see it in high and very, very advanced degenerated knees, most likely like this one, but idiopathic you can see in young people. So as we say, uh, it's a benign neoplastic process. The primary is of unknown etiology. These are the phases that we describe, initial phase, transitional phase, and inactive phase. And the treatment is at the body removal and um, most of the time synovectomy. The most likely differential diagnosis that you will encounter on a test is PVNS, pigmented villonodular synovitis. Uh, PVNS is monoarticular. It's also a metaplasia of the synovium. However, it never calcifies. So in general terms, it will be in the differential diagnosis of synovial chondromatosis, but not osteochondromatosis because PVNS doesn't calcify. In MRI, they look similar because they both bleed and can have hemosiderin deposition within the joint, and that causes blooming artifact and low signal intensity on T1 and T2. But once it's calcified, PVNS should not be in the differential diagnosis. Synovial hemangiomas, just because of the distension of the joint, it doesn't calcify it either, it's more common in, in children. And lipoma arborescence is very common with degeneration, it's just lipomatous hypertrophy within the joint, and also like synovial osteochondromatosis, the secondary type, you see it a lot in very degenerated uh, knee joints. So here we have a chest radiograph, and what we see is that both scapula appear elevated. Uh, they're almost at the level of the neck. This may be hard to see if you're not used to looking at this all the time because it's bilateral. If this finding would have been unilateral, it would have been very easy for you to spot. So elevation of the scapula, also known as wing scapula, is also called Sprengel's deformity. 
And this is usually a congenital problem that you have hypoplasia um, of the scapula and or the surrounding muscles that uh, give stability to the scapula. This is usually the etiology is vascular interruption uh, early on at embryonic stages, uh, usually the subclavian, distal subclavian artery. Uh, how severe will be the hypoplasia and the wing scapula depends on how proximal the interruption was. If it was at the suprascapular artery, it will be uh, the least abnormal. Then the internal thoracic artery will be intermediate and at the level of the subclavian artery it will be a lot of abnormality. If there is interruption of the blood supply of the subclavian artery proximally uh, before the thoracic inlet, that will be causing Poland syndrome, which you we may see a case of that later on. So bilateral wing scapula, Sprengel's deformity, this is associated to Klippel's fail syndrome, something you should remember for the test. And commonly you see an homo vertebral bar or bone, and that is an abnormal bone or fibrous connection between the cervical spine right here and the superior aspect of the scapula. That will be an homovertebral bone. Also, this is associated to other vertebral anomalies and this patient has bilateral cervical ribs. So this type of abnormalities coexists with other abnormalities, which is at least good to know which are the, the major ones uh, uh, and understand that Sprengel's deformity is associated to many other abnormal abnormalities, but would be good for you to remember um, the omovertebral bone and cervical ribs and clipal fails syndrome. So if the muscles that are hypoplastic or absent around the scapula is the rhomboid trapezius, levator scapulis, and serratus anterior. And all these are the associated anomalies. So we have a skeletally immature radiographs of bilateral legs, and we see there is virus, angulation of the knees, genovirus, and there is some fragmentation and bone resorption at the medial aspect of the proximal tibia, which extends uh, from the epiphysis, growth place, and metaphysis, and this is a bilateral finding. This is one of those aunt mini cases that you either have seen before or you haven't. This is Blount's disease, which is also known as osteo uh, congenital tibia vara and it's just osteochondrosis of the medial aspect of the tibia which usually is bilateral. It's in the differential diagnosis of tibial bowing so it is an osteochondritis. An osteochondritis is what I call a trash can term. It's a term that most of the people use and the growing skeleton for bone death created by necrosis, so osteo of the bone and chondrosis of the cartilage, so at the end of the bones, um, but also it can be related to microtrauma and there's a lot of, lot of terms, Blounds, Keenbox, Shummermans, Kohlers, and all those terms go in the trash can of, of osteochondrosis, but uh, in general terms we use it to describe necrosis in the growing skeleton and Blount is the one that is of the proximal medial tibia. It can cause growth disturbances and the treatment uh, if it's in the, the late one is usually osteotomy to correct the angulation. The infantile when they're very young kids uh, usually is conservative. So here we have a patient with chronic hip pain presented to the clinic and we got some initial pelvic radiographs. So on this initial pelvic radiograph, sometimes when I show this to the residents, they can't find anything. But the good thing with the body is that in general terms, we're symmetric. And this femoral head and neck looks different on the right side than from the left side. You can obviously see there is thickened trabecula on the right side and maybe some enlargement of the bone. So if you say thick in trabecula, what needs to come to your mind first is Paget's disease or osteitis deformance. 
Paget's disease is a disease of abnormal remodeling of the bone. So we have talked a lot about the osteoclasts that resorb and eat the bone and the osteoblasts which form the bone and how they need to keep in balance. So in Paget's disease, for the most part, they are both working, the osteoclasts and the osteoblasts, but the remodeling is abnormal. So sometimes the osteoclasts work a little more and sometimes the osteoblasts work a little more depending on the face. But even though they're both working pretty hard, it's imbalanced, it's abnormal. The remodeling of the bone, how they work is abnormal, which is different from osteoporosis, which osteoclasts work more and some other conditions that we're gonna describe later on. So notice in this radiograph too, we see this sharp differentiation in the cortex of the proximal femur between the uh, subtrochanteric region and the diaphysis. That's what is called the blade of grass. So before getting into that description, the three phases of Paget's disease is the active lytic, which you see more osteoclastic activity and more bone resorption. And then there's the active one, but mixed. You, you have osteoblastic and osteoclastic activity, and you see both regions of uh, lucency and lytic, lytic regions and regions of sclerosis. And then the third one is inactive. There is no activity in the remodeling and it's called the sclerotic phase. So the blade of grass or flame, uh, or the flame shaped uh, abnormality is when the active lytic phase is going through the bone. So you see that sharp interface of a lucency versus normal bone. Uh, and then thick and trabecula and, and enlargement of the bones are very, very, very um, characteristic hallmarks of the disease. So this is different patients with the same condition in the skull. You may get asked, what do you see in the skull in Paget's disease? And one of the things you see is the cotton wool skull. It's like you have a bunch of like cotton and within the skull and it has that patch sclerosis. The other one is a punch out lesion that is called osteoporosis circumscrita. That's things that you see in the skull and the spine. You see an enlarged vertebral body uh, with thickened trabecula. And um, this is uh, a buzzword as well called the picture frame vertebra. Uh, it's very characteristic of Paget's. But if you kind of look at it closely, you can see that this vertebral body actually is a little bit larger than the rest of the vertebral bodies. So cotton wool skull, osteoporosis circumscrita, blade of grass, picture frame vertebra, all this tr thickened trabecula, or all, all these are uh, buzzwords for Paget's disease. Also Paget's disease is most common on Caucasians uh, and it's slightly more common on males than on females. Uh, it's, uh, affects most the spine and the pelvis more than any other bones and it's usually an asymmetric uh, involvement and other thing that you have to remember is that pagetoid bone because of increased vascularity and remodeling is at higher risk of developing osteosarcoma which is called pagetoid osteosarcoma so if you see paget bone and you follow it up and in the test they ask you we're following up pagets and suddenly there is bone destruction you have to think about the generation into osteosarcoma, also known as pagetoid osteosarcoma. So here we have a case of a patient that has been followed for a condition. Um, and we have some radiographs of some parts of the body. Here we have the left hand, PA view, and then we have a view of the pelvis. In this view, we see that this patient has multiple osseous lesions at the metacarpal bones, at the, some of the phalanges. Uh, there are some lesions within the proximal femur and at the parasymphyseal regions, there are some lesions. If we take the hand, these lesions appear to be expansile. They have endosteal scalloping, and be to, appear to be almost like multiloculated. And these are multiple enchondromas. Enchondromas usually happen at the metaphysis of the bone. They're very common in the hand. Uh, in the hand, they may or may not show, show chondroid matrix, which is the mineralization of chondroid lesions. So enchondromas may not have any chondroid matrix at all. We see enchondromas very common in the body, usually incidental findings on knee MRIs. And when they're very small, we try to just not pay much attention to it. 
Uh, there's a lot of talk about enchondromas because there is no way for us to differentiate an enchondroma from a chondrosarcoma by on base of imaging findings alone. Uh, but we see them so often that when they're small, we just usually try to not ignore them, but um, not put too much importance on it. Uh, there's a lot more information in the radiograph. So patient has had a prior osteotomy of the left iliac crest. So we have multiple enchondromas throughout the body. And this is multiple enchondromatosis or just simply enchondromatosis. Uh, this historically has been known as Olier's disease. Now the terminology may be confusing because Olier's is some people reserve that term just when the abnormality of the multiple enchondromas is asymmetric in the body and people use enchondromatosis when you see multiple enchondromas in the body and it's symmetric throughout the body. Uh, but Olier's and enchondromatosis in general terms mean the same. Now, what is important with this? Well, to recognize it, that when you see multiple enchondromas, then you have to think about enchondromatosis. Also, this patient has, they have a higher risk of developing or degenerating any of these enchondromas to chondrosarcoma. And uh, as, well, the literature may vary, but I, I read even up to 40% in the adult. So there is a significant chance. And in fact, in this patient, he had developed an a chondrosarcoma, one of the enchondromas in the iliac crest, and um, and had to be resected. So, with disease and chondromatosis, things that you need to remember for the test in the growing child, it causes pain because of deformity. But if in the adult there is no more growth of bone, and any enchondroma that is known that suddenly is painful, you have to be suspicious for chondrosarcoma degeneration. Uh, for the test 2 and chondromatosis with soft tissue hemangioma is known as Mafuchi's disease and enchondromatosis with osteochondromas is known as meta metachondromatosis. So here we have uh, PA radiographs of mostly the right hand and in a patient with a chronic hand pain. And what we see here is that there is some minimal periostitis around the diaphysis of the proximal interphalangeal joints. Um, bilaterally, we see it here, most of the diaphysis of the proximal interphalangeal joints. So when we see this, we have to think about the general differential diagnosis for diffuse periostitis. Uh, this is only in the hands and only in the proximal phalange. So there is a differential diagnosis for this that you need to start thinking about. Uh, but in the test, you may be shown uh, another image like this with uh, enlargement of the extraocular muscles. I am no neuroradiologist, so I'm not going to say much about this, but this is seen in Graves' disease. This is uh, thyroid ophthalmopathy. And what we see in the radiographs in that preoster reaction is related to thyroid acropachy which is kind of a range and ray classic, uh, something that we don't see often in our practice, but it comes often in tests because it's in the differential diagnosis of diffuse periostitis or periosteal reaction. I think the major things you have to remember for periostitis or periosteal reaction is uh, hypertrophic osteoarthropathy, which used, used to be called secondary pulmonary osteoarthropathy because it was first seen on chronic lung cancer then it was associated to chronic disease of the heart and, el and elsewhere and pachydermal periostitis which is also primary uh, osteoarthropathy leukemia hypervitaminosis vitaminosis a all those things can give you periostitis uh, actually thyroid acropachy is one of the least common it's actually in 0.3 percent of patients with graves disease so not all patients with graves disease get this it's really hard to treat all the treatment with steroids that we give for uh, um, skin and, and problems of the eyes with uh, thyroid disease and hyperthyroidism don't have any effect on, on thyroid acropachy, but some of the patients are asymptomatic. The periosteal reaction is usually uh, perpendicular and um, it's in the diaphysis of the bones of the hand and feet. It doesn't affect the axial skeleton. Uh, it spares the end of the bones like the epiphysis. And um, 
I guess one thing you may want to remember for the test is that even when you take the thyroid out and you treat Graves' disease, this uh, periostal reaction persists and you actually can develop thyroid acropachy after you have had thyroidectomy. So something you to remember in terms of a test. So here we have a patient on NICU, a very small baby. And what we see on this radiographs of the chest and pelvis is that there is diffuse chlorosis of all the bones that we can see. There appears to be no medullary cavity. It's almost like there is uh, somebody have taken these bones and just do a lot of drawing with chalk. Uh, there is a complete sclerosis of all the bone. So when we see this, we have to think about diffuse um, sclerosis and the differential diagnosis, and that will vary between an adult and a pediatric. Uh, but one of the first uh, the things or the diagnosis you have to think first is osteopetrosis, osteoform bone, petrosis, which comes from the Latin root of, of, of stone, so st bones of stone. And that one is related to a failure of osteoclastic activity. And because you don't have any osteoclast in the body, you cannot eat up the bone and you deposit all this bone. Uh, the, we have, it has been described as a bone in a bone appearance and under tubulation, under tubulation because there is no medullary cavity. It all looks like cortex. And although these bones look as they would be very strong, they're not, they're very fragile, they're brittle. Uh, because there's just not the normal architecture that will give tensile force to the bone. So this is a case of osteopetrosis, diffuse in the differential diagnosis of diffuse sclerosis of the bone. So things to remember for the test is related to osteoclastic failure. That's why you have so much uh, bone production because there is no bone resorption. And there are three clinical groups, although uh, the groups are usually divided into, but uh, because the infantile malignant autosomal recessive, it's just uh, kids die in utero or just uh, short after being born. But the intermediate autosomal recessive is the first ticket of life. These patients usually die young or maybe to midlife. And the autosomal dominant, also known as Albert Schumber disease or marble bones, uh, the life expectancy is normal. Uh, the treatment for this is a bone marrow replacement to try to produce normal cells and normal osteoclasts and osteoblasts and obviously osteocytes. Um, uh, but this patient has have higher risk for fractures and we see them on clinics. They do follow up films and you see fractures of different uh, stages of healing and some deformity because the bones are, are brittle. In terms of like diffuse sclerosis of the bones, I think they're like leukemia can give you that um, in, in a child. There's, uh, of course, metastatic neuroblastoma. You, you would hear pycnolysostosis, meloriostosis, which are really, really uh, rare disease, but are in the differential diagnosis of, of uh, diffuse bone sclerosis. And in the, in the adult, you have to always think about the metabolic bone, bone disease, uh, renal osteodystrophy, uh, Sickle cell disease can give you diffuse sclerosis of parts of the bone. Polyostotic fibrous dysplasia in the skull and in the jaw can give you the appearance of diffuse sclerosis. So it's good to review the differential diagnosis of diffuse sclerosis. It varies from child uh, to adult. But when you see under tubulation and bone in a bone, think about osteopetrosis. So we have a patient with shoulder pain and we got an MRI after a normal radiograph. And this is just sagittal images of the shoulder at the level, obviously, of the scapula. And we see here the rotator cuff muscles. This is a T2 fat suppressed image, which makes fluid looks very, very bright. And it's called a, a, in MSK the pathological image. And it is obvious that we see edema at the infraspinatus muscles and the teres minor. So we have the teres minor here. Uh, we have the infraspinatus is divided by the spine of the scapula, which is right here, a supraspinatus muscle. And last, we have the subscapularis, which has the rotator cuff muscles. So when we see edema of a muscle, we need to think about nerve impingement, right? We see muscle edema in several things. Um, one is denervation, which in the shoulder MRI, when you see edema of a muscle is one of the things you have to think about. 
especially if it's in a test. But muscle edema can also be due to trauma, a strain of the muscle. It can also be due to infection. A myositis uh, can give you also muscle edema, and which will be inflammation or infection, any of those two. But denervation is one of the things that will give you muscle edema in the acute phase, and the chronic denervation will give you muscle atrophy. And muscle atrophy in MRI is seen uh, with fatty infiltration, which is a way to grade that too. So in the shoulder, there are three conditions that are very common to see in a test. Uh, one is uh, impingement of the suprascapular nerve at the suprascapular notch over here. Uh, impingement of the suprascapular nerve at the, uh, at the spinoglenoid notch. Uh, or uh, impingement of the axillary nerve at the region of the quadrilateral space, and a combination of any of them, which is Parsonage-Turner syndrome, which is a brachial neuritis. You have uh, inflammation of a nerve and it causes edema, but it's not in any particular distribution. This is a case of Parsonage-Turner because the infraspinatus is innervated by the suprascapular nerve, but the teres minor is innervated by the axillary nerve. So. When you have two distribution in the shoulder, you should think of Parsonage Turner, which is a, 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 a neural um, inflammation of the brachial plexus, usually viral etiology. Uh, later on, we're going to talk about the suprascapular notch impingement, as well as the spinoglenoid and quadrilateral space. But remember that for Parsonage Turner syndrome, you see edema of muscles in the shoulder that have different distributions, nerve distributions. This is a diagnosis of exclusion. Uh, you have to exclude all the other conditions that uh, I mentioned, and the treatment for this is supported because it's usually viral. It will go away by itself uh, with supportive treatment. Okay, so we have a patient with hand trauma after a ski accident and uh, an initial radiograph, so with PA lateral and oblique of the thumb. We see a corner fracture here at the base of the proximal phalanx of the thumb. It's mildly displaced, and this is where the ulnar collateral ligament lives, which is an important structure. This is called gameskeeper thumb. It is called gameskeeper thumb because in that old gameskeeper game, the player will break a rabbit neck, and that force that used with the thumb uh, will cause stretching of the ulnar collateral ligament and insufficiency and eventually tear. Uh, you can have, uh, so the ulnar collateral ligament will live right here. Right, we'll live right here, and you can have a uh, tear of the ligament and no fracture. That will be hard to see on radiographs, and you will have to do an MRI. But you can also have an avulsion fracture at the base of the proximal uh, phalanx. Uh, this has to be reduced surgically to maintain functionality. It, it comes in test because sometimes it cannot reduce by itself because you have the aponeurosis. Let's say this is the aponeurosis of the adductor pollicis. And this aponeurosis gets in the way of the fracture fragment and the base of the phalanx, and it doesn't let the, the fracture fragment reduce. So surgically, they have to remove the aponeurosis to be able to fixate it. When you do an MRI of this, uh, this has been called a yo-yo in a string sign, and that's the aponeurosis, which kind of um, becomes like a little ball because it's stuck between the the avulsed fragment and the bone, and it's uh, known as a yo-yo in a string. So gangskeeper thumb is injury to the ulnar collateral ligament. Nowadays it's called skier's thumb because it's more common in ski accident than, of course, in gamekeeper a game that we don't play that anymore, I guess. And it can be complicated with a stenner lesion, which we evaluate in MRI, and it's the aponeurosis of the adductor policies that gets in the way. And you have to get that out to be able to reduce uh, the fracture surgically. Uh, so this is what to know about gamekeeper's thumb, ulnar collateral ligament tear. Okay, so we have here a lateral skull radiograph of a patient. And when we see a skull, we tend to look for lesions in the in the bone, especially if we're talking about MSK, we don't do skull series too much any longer unless it's a VP shunt or um, you're looking for lesions like multiple myeloma, lytic lesion, we described already in Paget's osteoporosis circumscrita uh, or a cotton wool skull, uh, any other lesions that we can see in the skull, but 
for intracranial abnormality, obviously we don't do skull series anymore. But in this patient, there's something that uh, we need to look at. First, this patient is presenting with frontal bossing here. And also there's hyper, hyper aeration of the paranasal sinuses appear pretty big. Uh, and this is not really normal. And also, if you pay a lot of attention, there is some enlargement of the cella torsica. So this is a patient with acromegaly. And patients with acromegaly, of course, have abnormal excess growth hormone in the adult that the growth plates are closed in the pediatric is called gigantism. Uh, but acromegaly, uh, you produce too much bone because of the growth hormone stimulation and the bones get thick, uh, cortex get thick and bones get thick. But in the skull, you get that frontal bossing and hyper of the paranasal sinuses. And you may get uh, enlargement of the cella torsica if the excess growth hormone is caused by an enlarging pituitary macroadenoma. Also, uh, Acromegaly, we don't see that much in radiographs, the MSK uh, findings, because there's good treatment nowadays for it, so this would be considered a range and rate classic. But it still shows up some extent. So in the hand radiograph, the classic findings is the distal phalangeal tufts. They look like a spade. So it has been described as a spade-like phalangeal tuft. That's something that is very classic of acromegaly. Also note that the articular space is enlarged. And that is because in acromegaly, the excess of growth hormone causes uh, thickening of the cartilage. And that thickening of the cartilage will expand the articulation as we see it on the radiograph. As you know, in osteoarthritis, which is you have loss of cartilage due to degeneration, the space is decreased. It's one of the hallmarks of osteoarthritis, joint space loss. But in acromegaly, you may even see osteophytes and the generation of the articulation, but no decrease in the joint space. In fact, it's quite the opposite, it's enlarged. So those are some of the findings that we see in acromegaly. Also, I think it's good to remember that in the in the ankle, we may see a radiograph with a thickened heel pad. The measurement is 2.5 centimeter, more than 2.5 centimeter. Heel pad is suggestive of acromegaly. So remember the spade-like distal phalanx, frontal bossing and hyperation of the uh, paranasal sinuses, as well as enlarged cella torsica may be seen with acromegaly. So here we have another Rengen Ray Classic. This is a very old uh, film. I don't even know where I got it from, but this is one of the things that you either have seen it or not. So if you have seen it, you're probably gonna be able to make the diagnosis. Um, if you've never seen it, you'll be like, okay, I don't know what it is. That's why I call it on mini. But we have this thickening of the periosteum and some lines of sclerosis. This is meloriostosis, which is been described described as dripping candle wax. I think you see one and you've seen them all. There's not too many differential diagnoses for this. Uh, there's nothing really quite looks like it. I guess if it's very severe, it can give you diffuse bone sclerosis and it will go into differential diagnosis of bone sclerosis. Things to remember about this is kind of an it's, I mean, a mesen mesenchymal disorder and it can be polyostotic or monostotic, but however, it is monomelic, so it only happens in one extremity. And within that extremity, it can happen in several places, uh, but only in one extremity. And that's why uh, there is the theory of the dermatome. People think that, or there is evidence out there that meloreostosis happens in distributions of dermatome. So not much to know about this. The, remember the buzzword, candle wax dripping, and dermatome. Uh, it, it can affect the, in a, the dermatome distribution and it can be monostotic or polyostotic, but it's monomelic, only happens in one extremity. Also, it can coexist with osteopathia striata. It looks completely different and we may see a case later and osteopoikilosis, which is multiple uh, bone islands in the body.
So here we have a patient that presented with a palpable mass in the leg and initial radiographs were obtained. Uh, no osseous abnormality was seen and the mass, palpable mass was about this region and there is a little bit, a little bump in the soft tissues. However, that whatever is there has no calcification or any uh, increased density within that soft tissue bump that would suggest calcification at all. So, an MRI was obtained in this patient. And on the MRI, we have uh, axial T1, axial T2 with fat suppression, and axial T1 uh, post catalinium fat sat images. And here is a coronal T1. And we see a well defined mass here that is adjacent to the lateral aspect of the fibula. And this lesion is intermediate in T1. Is high on T2 and it seems to have peripheral enhancement. I guess this is the central region of necrosis. Things that we have when we see a soft tissue mass uh, that is not calcified in terms of imaging we often cannot be very specific but there are some lesions like this one that we can suggest the diagnosis first because of location. This is next to the fibula and that's where the peroneal nerve goes by. That's, that's, that's where it lives. So it is in the location or close to the location of the peroneal nerve. Also in the coronal image, we see this um, elliptical shape mass and we have this sign which is very helpful. This is called the split fat sign. So this is a nerve sheet tumor and the nerve sheet tumors go within the neurovascular bundle. And that's important because when it grows within the neurovascular bundle, which is surrounded by fat, it splits that fat. So that is the split fat sign. And we can tell pretty certain that this mass originated within the neurovascular bundle. And that is very common for nerve sheet tumors. There are two nerve sheet tumors, the schwannomas and neurofibromas. There's hard to differentiate and peripheral nerve sheet tumors just by imaging alone. Uh, nerve sheet tumors usually have a target appearance on T2. They're very bright on T2. In this case, it has internal hemorrhage and internal, internal necrosis, sorry, and that's why we see no enhancement. And we have to be in the lookout when we see one to look for others because in neurofibromatosis type 1, you have multiple neurofibromas in the body. And you have to uh, check for degeneration. In terms of neurofibromas, larger than 5 centimeter, internal necrosis, heterogeneous enhancement, all those things are worrisome for degeneration into neurofibrosarcoma. So things you need to keep an eye on. So this is a patient with neurofibromatosis type 1 and a neurofibroma in the peroneal nerve, and, but it's, it will look similar to a schwannoma. And remember the target sign and the split fat sign because it goes in the neurovascular bundle. This is a good time to review the MSK findings that we see in neurofibromatosis type 1, the sutural defects, usually at the lambo lambdoid suture, sphenoid wing defects in the school series or CT, scoliosis, kyphosis, the vertebral scalloping uh, that we see on the uh, spine imaging, bowing of the tibia, pseudoarthrosis, of course, nerve sheet tumors that we have described, and the malignant degeneration of nerve sheet tumors is, is in the 2% to 20, 29%. So we have radiographs of the left hip in internal and external rotation, patient with hip pain. We didn't see any acute abnormality within the bones or articulation in this radiograph. However, we saw a lesion within the intertrochanteric region of the proximal femur. What is characteristic of this lesion? The first thing is location. It's right there in the proximal femur, so metaphysis, the femoral neck is part of the articulation, so it's part of the articulation, part of the intertrochanteric region. It has very well-defined borders and are thin and sclerotic. So this is an inactive lesion. Remember, this the, the thin sclerotic borders well-defined means that the osteoblasts have had time to uh, mount a response and have completely stopped anything that was growing here. So this lesion is either inactive or very, 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 very slowly growing. It's not aggressive. The sonar transition is very narrow. And how about the matrix? The matrix is not completely lucent. It's not sclerotic. We don't see chondroid matrix. We don't see bone formation. 
is kind of in between. This is what is called a ground glass matrix, ground glass opacity, if you were in the lung. Um, but in the bone, this is very characteristic of fibrous dysplasia. And this is a quite a good location for fibrous dysplasia. It's a non-aggressive lesion. There is a problem of maturation of the osteoblast in fibrous dysplasia. And it can be monostotic, things that ask in test, if, uh, how many fibrous dysplasia can you have? Well, it can be monostotic and it can be polyostotic. Uh, they can grow quite large and cause a lot of deformity. They can cause endosteal scalloping and cortical thinning. But there are non-aggressive lesions. There are benign lesions. So ground glass opacity, non-aggressive lesion, usually in the proximal femur around the pelvis, think about fibrous dysplasia, that ground glass matrix, not calcified, not chondroid, not loosened, just like a ground glass. So things to remember about fibrous dysplasia is a developmental anom anomaly. Uh, Remember the shepherd crooks is because of the deformity of the proximal femur, some, something that they may ask you. And things for the test to remember, the McCoon Albright syndrome, the Coffeole, fibrous dysplasia and all that, uh, and, and cherubism that you might want to remember. And massa brow syndrome, which is fibrous dysplasia with mixed somatous tumors. So those things are uh, kind of names and terms that you should remember for the test because they come up and usually come associated to fibrous dysplasia. So here we have a patient with bilateral radiographs, AP of the knees, and what is obvious to all of us is that there are a bunch of soft tissue calcification throughout the soft tissues that we see, distal thigh, proximal leg. So this is a patient with dermatomyositis, but I think it's a good time to talk about soft tissue calcifications. Soft tissue calcifications are, are pretty common. I think that when we see soft tissue calcifications, we have to kind of divide if it's a dystrophic calcification or if it's metabolic calcification, um, which we also know as metastatic. So, and dystrophic calcification is up to 98% of all the calcifications that we see, and dystrophic means that it's been sequela of some type of muscle death, which can be caused by trauma, inflammation, infection. If you have any of those and the muscle die or the soft tissue die, it ends up calcifying and ends up being a dystrophic calcification. The, the metastatic calcifications are related to imbalances in the metabolism of calcium. And those are less common. So because there's because dystrophic are so common, I think when you see a calcification, the first thing you need to do is, is the calcium metabolism of this patient is normal. And if it's normal, you just got to figure out what happened here, what type of necrosis happened here that we ended up with this with calcification. And although most calcifications look similar and the same, we can type of, we can differentiate them depending on the clinical history, location, and so forth. For example, in this patient, we see calcifications everywhere. So we're thinking that there is something systemic that is causing this calcification. If the patient has normal calcium metabolism, it's probably a, a systemic inflammatory disease. In this case, it's dermatomyositis, which is a, a chronic systemic inflammatory disease, and you see calcification everywhere. In an inflammatory arthropathy, you may see calcification around a joint. If patient had trauma to the proximal thigh on the left side, you may see calcification on on that region related to prior myonecrosis. So, you know, that can help you in the differential diagnosis. Also remember that some infections and parasites give you very peculiar calcifications like cystocercosis, uh, but we may discuss that later on in other cases. So, soft tissue calcification, dystrophic versus metastatic. Thankfully, dystrophic is up to 98% of them. And what you have to figure out after you exclude calcium metabolism problem is what happened that this tissue died and we ended up with this uh, dystrophic calcification. So a case of dermatomyositis, polymyositis. Uh, we do MRI for this in the early stages of the proximal thigh to see if there's patchy myositis, which we see as focal muscle edema with subtle enhancement. We do a biopsy of that to see if there's act active myositis. In the chronic phase, obviously, we see muscle atrophy. Um, 
the different diagnoses will be other uh, inflammatory disease like scleroderma, lupus, and mixed connective soft tissue disease, so dermatomyositis and soft tissue calcifications. Thank you so much for looking at my cases. I uh, hope you find this board review useful. I try to give you key information that may be high yield for the uh, board court examination. Uh, this is the first series. I'm going to post more cases. Each series will have 20 cases. Uh, so you can sub subscribe to the channel or I will post the updates in my Twitter and, and Instagram and Facebook accounts. So you know when I put new cases for the board review. Thank you so much.